beautiful singing by three different groups. And they were very, very well done. All of them are so beautiful. It really is inspiring. That's one of my favorite songs. I know it holds tomorrow. And um, thank you guys for singing that. I'd like for you to turn the Bible this morning to the book of Luke, the 16th chapter, and the 19th verse. I've told you guys about this before, but years ago I had a friend named uh, Ann Rollins, and uh, we went to the same church, and we were, we were friends, and uh, she began to tell us about her father, and I, I met her father one time uh, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where he lives. Now her father, Dr. Rollins, was a medical doctor, and he specialized in heart transplants and, and working with hearts, and he was so good with what he did then he became the, the top doctor in the country and was the private doctor of the president and had a very, very high position uh, in the government as a doctor. And he was that good. After he finished practicing, he, he bought uh, buildings in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, which I got to see and he created his own hospital. So if a guy is so good that he can have his own hospital, then he must be a, a really good physician. He wrote a book about an experience that he had about midway through his life. As he was being a doctor and he was in this lucrative position that he was in, is in this well-known position that he was in. He wasn't a Christian. He was a lost man. He was a lost doctor. He was a good doctor, a very good doctor. Maybe the best there was in his field. But he was still just a lost man without Jesus. He was physically alive, he was intellectually alive, he was medically alive, but he was spiritually dead. He had no spiritual life. And we talked about in Sunday school this morning that God will break in upon a sinner, and when God is ready to save a sinner, he will come to that sinner, he will find where he is, and he will begin to work upon that sinner to bring him to salvation. It's called irresistible grace. I talked to Ramzan yesterday and we talked about an hour on the phone and I'll tell you all about it at lunch. But he, he was talking about what he was going to preach on in the, in the conference. And he was, he was talking about preaching on the power and the authority and the power of God in salvation. And, and that's the same militant tone that we're going to strike at the conference. Because I, I know that when Jeff Rose gets there, that it will become a militant conference as soon as he stands up and the words come out of his mouth. I too want to preach that way. And everybody on the program, I hope, will catch that spirit after the first service and, and begin to preach a powerful, militant gospel that attacks Satan, that attacks sin, that attacks the wicked culture in our country, that attacks the enemies of the gospel, and that will attack false doctrines, which sends people to hell. And Ramzan, I asked him, I said, can you incorporate in that sermon the, the, the point 
of irresistible grace. And he said, certainly I will do that. And that's what happens. It's irresistible. When God begins to work upon a sinner, they will not be able to resist the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, one byproduct of God doing that is that that sinner that God saves will no longer be headed to an eternal hell and will not have to suffer for his sins because Jesus has already suffered for his sins. Well, Dr. Rollins had that kind of experience. He was a lost doctor. And God broke into his life in a very, very unusual way. A very, very dramatic way. And a very, very powerful way. Which led to his salvation. As I said, I've told you before. But Dr. Rollins was performing heart surgery on a patient. And he was about to bring the uh, people in to give him the, uh, the anesthetic so he could be able to be put to sleep. And, and once he was put to sleep, they, they began the operation. Well, before this happened, the guy started to go under. And, and then something happened to him. And as the story was told, it was either before the surgery or right after the surgery when the man was recovering or either that the man woke up during surgery. I don't really remember the sequence of events to make it accurate. But I know that somewhere between those parameters that the story is told by Dr. Rollins that the man became conscious and he began to cry out, Doc, Doctor, help me, help me. He said, help me, I'm, I'm in hell, I'm burning, I, I can feel the flames of hell as he was about to, to die. And it's been a long time, so I don't remember how they got to that point, but the, the important point is that the man was about to die and he began to feel the fires of hell lapping around him and he was still conscious and he cried out for Dr. Rollins to help him to do something. And Dr. Rollins was astonished. He was, he was flabbergasted. And he was also very frightened because he'd never experienced anything like this before. And he was frightened because it was so dramatic and he knew the man and the man was crying out to him and as brilliant as Dr. Rollins was being maybe the number one heart doctor in the United States of America knowing the answers to everything being so intelligent that he they even, even had his own hospital, he was totally ignorant of this situation. He was completely baffled with all of his knowledge and all of his experience. He did not know what to do and what to say. And he found himself in a very uncomfortable position that he had never been in in his whole life. He had no answers. But he had to do something. He had to think quickly. He had to, he had to react quickly because he could see that perhaps the man was going to die and pass into the afterlife. And the man was grasping him by the, by the collar and he was screaming in his face, Doc, help me, help me, I'm in hell, I'm in hell. And I ask you this question, what would we have done? 
Would we have known what to do? Would we have known how to tell a man about Jesus and, and pray with him? Now, I don't put much faith in foxhole and deathbed conversions because so many times they prove to be false and, and a manipulation just to get God and get you out of hell. But this, this event was not staged. This event was not something that was expected. It was thrown upon Dr. Rollins and he never saw it coming. And so he began to grasp for words. And I suppose even though he wasn't a church going man, and even though he wasn't a Christian, in all of his writing and all of his reading, over the years, he must have heard something about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he fumbled around, and to the amazement of all the assistants around the operating table, which was also probably embarrassing to him, he began to say the best thing that he knew to say. And he said something to the effect of you know, you're about to die. Uh, you, you need to give it up and you need to, you need to get rid of your sins and confess your sins. and You need to, to pray to God and, and, and pray to Jesus and cry out to Him. He didn't know what to say. But he did a pretty good job of explaining that the man needed Jesus. The man began to pray. And he repented of his sins and he asked Jesus to save him. And he asked Jesus to give him salvation and grant mercy upon his soul. I know it's a strange thing, but I don't really remember the result of what happened. I probably need to go back and read the book again. But I can't remember whether the man died or whether he stayed alive or whether he showed signs of being saved later in his life. I just, sorry, I just don't remember. And I guess maybe the reason I don't remember is that the illustration when I was told this was so dramatic and it was so horrifying and, and it was something that was so unusual that the main thing that I got from it was that the man was dying and he felt <clears throat> the flames of hell. That's the main thing that I got from it. And that at that time, in that place, that man believed there was a hell. I pray that God had mercy upon the man and that he saved him. I can't report that to you today in an affirmative manner. But that's always been my prayer. But I do know this. I, I don't know whether that man was saved. And, and he may have been since God works so dramatically in this situation. But I do know this. I can give you this morning a good report because I know that God used that experience to save a man. He used that experience to cause Dr. Rollins to begin to examine spiritual reality. He used that experience to cause Dr. Rollins to begin to read his Bible, which he had never done before. He used that experience 
to begin to work in the heart and the life of one of the most brilliant men in this country to show him that he was undone and he was a novice when he came to spiritual things. And I know that God also, in time, regenerated Dr. Rollins, brought him to his knees, implanted the Holy Spirit of God inside of him, and gave him the gift of faith and repentance to believe and repent of his sin. And he became a Christian. Not everybody has a dramatic experience like that to bring them to the Lord. And the title of the sermon today is Though one be raised from the dead, they will not believe. Though the one raised from the dead they still will not believe. Can you repeat that? The one. The one. The. No. T h o u g h t. No. I think. The one is raised from the dead. They will not believe. That will be in the text at the end this morning. This morning I'm, I'm going to preach on the subject of eternity. Now, if a preacher who believes the Bible anywhere in the world stands to preach upon eternity, a necessity that preacher will have to preach about heaven, and about hell. Because that's what the Bible teaches Amen. makes up eternity. Amen. One is good, one is bad. And you know, I, I, I keep wondering, and I, 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 I hate to say this to you all the time, but even though we know the scripture and we know the doctrines even though we know that lost people are dead in sins and, and they have no spiritual life and they don't want to have a spiritual life and they don't want Jesus in their life they will not want anything to do with him it still astounds me in my fleshly mind that people can read and see that the Bible teaches there is a hell and they still won't do anything about it. It's like they, they're okay with it. They, they'll just go there and like Loretta said in Sunday school this morning, they'll they, they're under the sad illusion that they're just going to go down there and hang out with their friends and, and get drunk and party and have a good time. Beloved, there's not going to be any beer in hell. And if there were, it would be too hot to drink. There's not going to be any parties in hell. Believe me. The only thing there's going to be in the hell is suffering and pain and told me, and I don't say that with a smile on my face, and I never have, because it's a serious thing. I don't really glory in preaching about the subject. It's unpleasant. It's scary. It's frightening. And it's amazing that we as Christians are probably more frightened and more fearful of hell than the majority of lost people. And I think the majority of them just don't believe it. Amen. If they don't believe in Jesus and they won't 
surrender their lives to him and become his servant. And if they don't believe in God, then they certainly won't believe in hell because they don't want to believe in hell to begin with. And any preacher who is worth his salt will continue to preach upon hell. Amen. They're running the risk of being called a, a hell, hellfire, hellfire, South Carolina, a damnation preacher. But the reason that preachers preach about it is because they believe in it and they simply do not want people to go there. That's the only reason. There's no joy in preaching on hell. Amen. It, it, it's like a it's like a warning warning sign. It's like a warning sermon. There's a was a commercial on TV not long ago about a, I think it was about based on tires about a guy that was heading down a road and there was a. The bridge was out, it was raining, and a little rabbit or something ran out in front of him and, and made him stop. And he got mad at the rabbit or whatever it was for making him stop. And he got out of the car and he looked and he realized that the little critter saved his life because then he saw the bridge that was out. That's kind of what we do as preachers and Christians. We warn people about the impending danger and the punishments that's to come. And if people don't believe that sin is a reality, then my question to them would be, if sin is not real, if sin is not significant in God's sight, why would He create a place like hell to punish sin? Sin is a horrible thing. And we also talked about in Sunday school that, that most people don't even know the sinners. They don't realize it. And beloved, it's up to us to share with them the gospel so that it will be used of God for God, if He so chooses, to reach into their hearts and save them today, tomorrow, the next day, or whenever. And one of my favorite prayers in all the world is from the lips of Brother Selwyn. Lord, save that sinner nearest to him. It's a good prayer. Isn't it? Good prayer. Let's read the story real quick. Verse 19, chapter 11. In Luke, verse 16, chapter 16, I'm sorry, oh, I messed up. Chapter 16, verse 19, 16, 19, I got it right. It says that there was a rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he might dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, in my Bible, this is, this is a simplified exegesis. The letters are in red. And I learned in Sunday school as a small boy that when the letters, letters are in red in the Bible, it means that Jesus is talking. 
Now, one reason that I believe that there is a hell is because the person with the help of the Father and the Holy Spirit, this person is the one with those other two people that created hell in the beginning. I would think that the persons that created something would know more about it than anyone else. And Jesus is telling this parable. And it's a scary, frightening parable. Several things we learn in this illustration is that it, it appears as soon as the rich man died, he lifted up his eyes in hell and he went immediately to hell. The second thing is that he was able to recognize Abraham. He was able to recognize he, he still had his consciousness. The Seventh-day Adventists will tell you that, and many others, that, that annihilation is all that's going to happen to you. We had a guy tell us one time that we will burn long enough to pay for our sins, and then we'll be annihilated. Now, now, the only problem with that theology is you won't find that in God's Word. It's not there. It says here that they were conscious, both he and Lazarus, where they ended up. You're not going to miss dying in Ali. People who go to hell are going to be conscious of what's going on. And the fire was great because he asked for Lazarus to dip his finger in a cup of water and just put it on his tongue. And I, I have to believe that because it's also in the scripture. It gives me no pleasure to preach it except as a warning. And then he said, I am tormented in this flame, which tells us that there are flames of fire in hell and that there's torment in hell. So I, I guess I'm preaching more to us today than I am to them. They're sinners. They, they enjoy their sin. If they're not Christians, then they really don't want to be saved. They enjoy what they've got and they reject Jesus. So you can't blame hell for the way they're living in this life. It's because they love their life. And no matter how much we talk to them and witness to them and try to share Jesus with them, you will find that people will, will reject him and finally many times reject you and won't talk to you anymore because they don't want to hear about Jesus. Amen. Now God's not responsible for that. They do that themselves. That's right. Amen. Their heart is dark. And then there, Abraham in 25 said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime Receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great <coughs> gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. You know, May the 25th, Earl Blackman, Blackman of Heritage Baptist Church in Shreveport, Louisiana, will be standing here where I am standing now. I've heard Earl Blackman preach two times. 
And he's one of the greatest preachers I've ever heard preach. He's delivered. His voice, which is much deeper than mine, with a little bit of a Cajun accent. And his delivery is powerful. And what comes out of his mouth is even more significant because it's proper biblical doctrine and proper biblical gospel. I heard him preach, I think on justification one time. He believes, as we believe, he believes the entire Bible. But Brother Earl was going to preach that day. And they were going to go over to Chestertown to the college and have our conference, Monday through Thursday. And the, and the name of the conference, the theme is the doctrines of grace, theology and methodology of evangelism. We're going to have Jeff Rose and Dave Griffin and Chris Simply come and Si Brook and Kate are supposed to come and bring as many of their brothers that they can bring. And one guy, Kevin Kelly, who's a friend of Chris, has written this week. He talked to us earlier. He just got an email two days ago and He's planning to come all the way from North Carolina and bring his capital behind him because he's going to Canada to go across the country and preach all summer. But on the 24th or the 25th, he's going to bring that camper right outside of this parking lot and hook up the water to it. And he's going to live in the camper while he and his family, his wife and three kids, go to the conference every day. Now when those guys get there, what they want to do is in the afternoon after the morning service is go out into the community or be brought over to the abortion clinic in Dover, wherever we decide to go, and they want to do evangelism, preach the gospel and witness. And I pray that others will go out and witness to the day all across Chestertown and, and hopefully bring back people to the services at night that need to be saved. That's called evangelism. And beloved, the reason that we do evangelism, the reason that we tell people about Jesus, and the reason we share our testimony with them and witness to them, is because we do not want them to go to this place that we're preaching about this morning. I want us to catch a new vision of lost people and what's going to happen to them if they're not saved. <laughs> now God has always, He's always used men and women as instruments to go out and tell the people about his son and proclaim the gospel through preaching, singing, witnessing in whatever way he leads. And we have a responsibility to do that. Jesus said, go you in all the world and preach the gospel and baptize those that are saved. That wasn't a suggestion. That was a commandment. And we, we, we need never grow wary of doing that. We've got to keep our heart on fire for those that are lost. Listen to what the man did, and I'll close with this. The rich man who was in hell. Now, this is astounding, and this can probably be multiplied over a million times. But the rich man who was in hell, we're about to read, waited 
until he got into hell before he did evangelism. It was a little late. He, he couldn't reach out and talk to someone else about Jesus. So he was left to depend on others. And here's what he did. He said, I pray to you, Abraham, go to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify unto them, that he may do evangelism unto them, that he may tell them about Jesus, lest they come into this place of torment. He waited until he was burning in hell, and he was unable to talk to his brothers, and he couldn't reach them, and then he thought about doing evangelism. He thought about witnessing to them. It was too late. Abraham told him it was too late. 29. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And if the rich man were talking to us today from hell, we would have to say to him, They have preachers. They have evangelists. Uh, your lost brothers have, have missionaries. They have the church. If you're in the south, they have a church on every corner. But then he said these sad words to Abraham. Last two verses. Verse 30. And he said, Nay, Father of Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. He was grasping at straws. He knew the torment he was in, but he did not want. He could not do anything about it, but he did not want his brothers to come to the same place. That's a sad story. And Abraham replied, he said unto him, If they hear not, speaking of the five brothers, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. That's close to the sermon title, it's the same basic meaning. Neither will they be persuaded, even though one is raised from the dead. And we know that, beloved. We're always talking to people about Jesus. I was in a restaurant last week. I'm not going to tell you it was Waffle House because you'll think that's the only place I eat. <laughs> but it was Waffle House. <laughs> or Awful House, however you want to pronounce it. To some of them. There's a waitress there that has been real nice and, and very courteous uh, that I've known when I've gone on there before. And she's always very friendly and, and, and you know, just a friendly person. Well, there was another waitress that waited on me the other day. And she's brand new. Well, the new waitress began a conversation with me, and the old waitress, uh, the, the former waitress, was uh, right beside her because she was training her. Well, it so happened that the new waitress began to talk about the Lord. And I told her that, you know, we were having a conference, and that I was a preacher, and she invited her to come. But, Invited her to come to their church. She got all the information down. And I say she's not here today. Let's hope and pray. Somebody will finally come. But I noticed that all of a sudden, when I mentioned the word preacher, the older waitress who had been very civil to me began to back up, literally. 
and go over and start washing dishes and would not even look at me. There's something about preacher, church, Bible, Jesus that scares the living daylights out of lost people sometimes. Amen. And remember Jesus said, I'm going to separate brother from brother, parents from children. I think that's what he was talking about. <clears throat> that's just a theory, but it's not important. It's not dogmatic. But when, when, they, when they really find out that you're going to talk about the Lord, they begin to distance themselves from you. And she never came back down there to where I was sitting again. Wow. It's just amazing. And that, 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 if that would have been a guy, a mechanic, working on my car, the same thing would have happened. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that when they find out you're a Christian, they, they look at you like you might have lep leprosy or something? Amen. It's strange. But it's just the way lost people are. And so I'm going to close. Real quick, Leland told me that in Belize that there, these scientists begin to create a, a sound system, a, a, a recorder that they would take and the geologists would place deep into the Earth's core to try to get to where the Earth was burning and boiling and hot. You know how the lava comes up out of the ground in Hawaii and places? That's what's down there. And we don't know exactly where hell is. But he said they put this sound system in there to listen to and that they begin to hear all these voices and they didn't know what was going on at first. And they begin to hear people screaming in anguish and pain and suffering and agonizing sounds that they, it, it creeped them out so much that they, they couldn't even hardly listen to it. And then somebody in the crowd, it must have been a Christian, said, my goodness, that, that sounds like people that are suffering in hell. And it sounded just like that. And you know, it, it was so frightening to them that they canceled the program and they pulled up the mics and they left over a period of time. Still not knowing exactly what it was. But it might have been hell. We don't know if it's down below the earth and the earth on, on the sun and Saturn. We don't know. But I had cold chills up my spine when Leland told me that story. And beloved, I'm not glorying this morning that anybody goes to hell. Please never believe that. But I'm saying to you and to me that we need to never forget but the Bible teaches there is a hell. Amen. And the lost people will go there to be punished for their sin. And we need, first of all, to be absolutely sure that me and you and all of us are, are right with God. And then we need to never forget that we should be telling the lost about Jesus and being witness to them. So that's really the basic theme of the sermon today is that we share Christ with other people and give them a warning of what's to come. And every Christian should do that. You know, there's a whole world out there where we've got plenty of prospects. And just be conscious and sensitive that when you're talking to anybody in any situation, even at the Waffle House, you know, it's good to share a word about the Lord Jesus. Brother Cross, would you lead us in our closing prayer, please?